I would like to turn and introduce to you our next speaker to begin our symposium for today. Dr. Amal Kara is an assistant professor and director of the Mitochondrial Disease Program at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. She completed her internal medicine residency and clinical genetic and metab um, metabolism fellowship through the genetics program at Harvard University. She's currently overseeing clinical care for pediatric and adult mitochondrial disease patients and conducting clinical research and clinical trials for the same. She is also the current Mitochondrial Medicine Society president, sits on the scientific and medical board of the Mitochondrial Disease Action Committee and the UMDF. Dr. Kara is also the founder and a board member of the Mitochondrial Care Network, a US-wide network developing ex expert centers for mitochondrial disease clinical trial network in the US. So thank you for being here, Dr. Kara. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole, and good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here and grateful to the MGA for this invitation. Um, this hour, I'll be trying to talk to you about um, the up mitochondrial diseases in general, mitochondrial myopathy in particular, and giving you some updates on what has been going on within the community, which is which, for which we're very excited because a, a lot more interest has been um, given to mitochondrial disorders and we have a lot of activities ongoing. Um, I haven't shared my slides, so let me start with that. Do you um, see my screen? I do. Okay, great. So um, to start, okay. Here we go. These are my disclosures. Um, as uh, Nicole said, I do see patients in clinic, but I also do a lot of consulting with um, uh, pharmaceutical companies and I run clinical trial and clinical research that is um, funded by several companies. What I'm going to talk to you about today is um, mitochondrial myopathy treatment and management in general. So nothing I say today is really intended for individual implication that you should go home and, and, and use yourself. You always have to really talk to your physician and um, make a plan together with your care team. So to begin with, I want I would like to tell you a little bit about what mitochondria are. Um, when I ask this question, um, everyone tells me that the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell, which is true. But what mitochondria are really are these small organelles that we can find in any cell in the body except for red blood cells. Um, and what we have is about one to a thousand of mitochondria in each cell. And depending on what the cell does in what organ it is found, you may have more or less mitochondria depending on how much energy and how much biologically active that cell cell needs to be or that tissue needs to be. So if you multiply that by the number of cells that we have in our body, which are multiple trillions of cells, um, you do the math, we will have many, many millions of mitochondria in our tissue and multiply that by the whole body, it's gazillions of different mitochondria. So mitochondria are very important for every aspect of our biology throughout the body. And that's why when we have mitochondrial issues, the whole body suffers. So what do mitochondria do? As I said, it's best known for its energy production. So what it does on a minute by minute basis is try to transform the food that you eat, whether it's fat, protein, or sugar, into a form of chemical energy that the cells can use to co conduct their what they need to do biologically. That form of energy is called ATP. And so in order to transform the food into ATP, the, the, the molecules of that food have to undergo multiple processes and they have to be broken down into the smallest molecule possible, which then enters the mitochondria and has to go through this um, chain reaction uh, in a system called the electron transport chain. And 
it looks very simple here because it's depicted like a, a small chain like in the cartoon, uh, but that chain and all of these reactions are very complex and require a lot of, uh, of proteins and a lot of enzymes and a lot of biological um, mach machinery to make that happen. And so when all of it works well, um, the mitochondria works like our energy plant. Um, it produces this constant energy that our body needs. Needs. But that's not all the story. Um, the mitochondria does many more things. And one of the things that it does is also it creates oxidative stress or free radicals. Those free radicals are the same radicals that would change your apple when you leave it on the kitchen counter and forget about it for a few days. It becomes oxidized, um, gets that brownish color, and then it rots. Um, the same thing happens in the body. Um, and if you, when you think about it, you might think it's gross and why the, is the body doing that? But that's actually part of the biology. If one of the cells in the body becomes dysfunctional, it's not performing well, or it has broken, the body needs to get rid of it. And one of the way to getting rid of it is to use oxidative stress and these free radicals to kill that cell so it doesn't infect or, um, or cause more cells to become dysfunctional. So that's a very important aspect of what mitochondria um, do. Uh, mitochondria are also involved in hundreds of different biochemical pathways, and every couple of years we discover new functions that it does. Um, and this is just a small simplification of what it, it does. So aside from breaking down the food, it also uh, is responsible for iron metabolism, calcium metabolism, steroid hormone metabolism, all sorts of different things um, that are very critical to the normal functioning of, of the body. Um, and how is this all possible that this small or organelle in the cell can really do all of this? Um, and that goes back to the, the genetics of the mitochondria. So the mitochondria has two types of genetic material. It has a nuclear DNA, which is found in the chromosomes. This is the DNA that you get from your mom and dad. Um, and then it has its own mitochondrial DNA, which is a circle, very small circle that has um, very few coded proteins. So together, they, um, they they create uh, all the proteins that are needed for this little organelle to do all of these things. And so sometimes you hear doctors say that mitochondrial diseases are inherited through the mother. And that's true if the defect in the DNA happens in the mitochondrial DNA because the mitochondrial mitochondria are transmitted in general by mothers to all of their children and not from fathers to the children. But there are a, a lot of different mitochondrial disorders that can also happen when nuclear DNA can become abnormal or dysfunctional or has mutations. And that type of DNA can be transmitted either from mom or from dad or from one of each or, um, or sometimes can happen by random chance. So it's not transmitted by anyone in a family, it's just by random um, misfortune happened in one person. We call that a de novo disease, meaning that it's new in that person. And so um, the, the genetics of mitochondrial disease makes it very compl complex as well and very, what, uh, heterogeneous, which means can vary significantly from one person to another. In general, it is accepted that one in 4,300 people can carry a change in their nuclear or mitochondrial DNA, and thus one in 4,300 people might have a mitochondrial disease. But we think it's still underdiagnosed because sometimes you have a lot of symptoms and people and doctors may not think about mitochondrial disease, so it may not get to, to that late stage of diagnostic and, and patient may not get that confirmation that they have a mitochondrial disease. So how does mitochondrial disease happen? Um, as I said, the mitochondria creates energy, but it's also responsible for a lot of different function in the body. So if you, if you carry a change in your DNA and that change causes the proteins that are needed to, um, to maintain that normal function of the mitochondria um, are disrupted, then that mitochondria is not able to function properly. So two things happen. One, 
you have less energy being made, and two, that oxidative stress or those free radicals that can damage the cell can increase in, in, in percent or increase in intensity. And so you end up going from a normally functioning mitochondria to a mitochondria that is diseased, diseased and that uh, is causing producing a lot more free radicals and not creating enough energy for the person to function properly. And because every cell is very dependent on that energy and can die quickly if exposed to a lot of free radicals, you start seeing cells in different organs uh, become also dysfunctional. And that's how symptoms arise in mitochondrial disease. Um, one thing that I wanted to emphasize is that when someone has a mitochondrial disease, it doesn't mean that every mitochondria in every cell becomes dis diseased. Um, there's always a mixture of some um, mitochondria that function okay or function properly and um, mitochondria that doesn't function at all or function much less efficiently, especially when you have a mitochondrial DNA problem. That's what we call the heteroplasmy, uh, which means means that there is a percentage of normal versus abnormal mitochondria within each cell. So when mitochondrial disease develop, because mitochondria, as I show, I've shown, is present everywhere, um, the mitochondrial disorder symptoms can be any really and can affect any organ, can affect any patient at any age. And um, as I've explained, can be transmitted by any genetic um, inheritance pattern, which makes it much more difficult for physicians to recognize it and to diagnose it in patients. Um, I put this here just to illustrate what that means in terms of thinking about the whole body. So in general, what, we, um, what happens is that organs that require the most energy to function properly are usually the first to develop symptoms and signs. So that includes the brain, the eye, the muscle, the heart, the intestines, um, and you can get any type of symptoms which are listed here. And so it doesn't mean that every patient with mitochondrial disease is going to develop all of these symptoms. Um, they can develop one symptom, they can develop two, a combination of five. Um, on average, the, there was a study done by um, the CHOP, um, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, that showed that patients with mitochondrial disease on average complain about 16 different symptoms. And so <clears throat> it's rare that we see one or two symptoms only. Um, so that's mitochondrial disease in general. So what about mitochondrial myopathy in particular? This concept really came about when we started doing clinical trial and trying to really focus on aspects of mitochondrial disease that we could change. And so an expert mitochondrial disease panel convened in Rome in 2017 and came up with, these, with this definition of what a mitochondrial myopathy is. And when I say primary, it means that it is a genetically inherited mitochondrial myopathy. Um, so a primary mitochondrial myopathy is a genetically defined mitochondrial disorder that predominantly but not exclusively affects skeletal muscle. Um, skeletal muscle, because the muscles are high energy demand organs, are common manifestation of mitochondrial disease. But when they represent the bulk of the symptom, the bulk of the concerns or the complaints of the patient, it is called the primary mitochondrial myopathy. So myopathy or muscle involvement can be the only manifestation of mitochondrial myopathy, or it can be associated with other symptoms such as the, those that I described earlier. So what are these symptoms of myopathy or muscle involvement? Um, so you could see here, they are listed, there's muscle weakness and fatigue, and most, almost uh, virtually every patient, more than 85% of all the patients with mitochondrial disease do complain of fatigue, but more so when muscles are involved, because, because as you can imagine, muscles are everywhere in our body. They are the, the largest, they represent the largest bulk of our organs. And so if you have a muscle that is affected by mitochondria that is not producing enough energy, the fatigue can be more profound. You can have muscle pain, 
you can have muscle cramping, stiffness. Um, sometimes when muscle is so tired or so depleted in energy, you can have paralysis where you cannot even move your muscles. You have exercise intolerance, um, which means that any little amount of exercise or physical activity can cause you to feel more tired, more weak, short of breath, and needing to stop and take a break. Other symptoms that can be seen specifically in mitochondrial myopathy or should prompt the doctors to think about mitochondrial myopathy right away are these eye muscle involvement. So muscles, the way around the eye, are very important for us to be able to move our eyes, look up and down, left, right. And we have a lot of different muscles. So we have muscles for each movement, muscles that pull to the right, to the left, up and down, to oblique, um, um, cross way. And then all of these muscles, as you can imagine, because we have two eyes, have to work in coordination, perfect coordination. Otherwise, we will see the same thing twice or triple. And so when mitochondrial disease is present and those eye muscles are not getting enough energy, you, a patient may develop what we call this progressive external ophthalmoplegia, meaning that those eye muscles are unable to function in a synchronous way um, together and then you have restricted eye movement where the muscle is unable to pull um, in, in, in some direction and you start seeing double because if each eye is looking in a different direction, not together, you are seeing the same object twice because each eye is sending a different image to your brain. Um, you can also develop ptosis, which is the drooping of the eyelids. Um, believe it or not, the eyelids, even though they are very thin, they have uh, a very active muscle in there that allows you to keep your eyes open throughout the day and to blink so that your eyes don't dry out. And so if that muscle becomes weak as well, then patients are not able to keep their eyes open and their, their muscle will droop. Um, if the facial muscles are affected, sometimes you get slurred speech, you get swallowing difficulties. If the chest wall muscles or the diaphragm, which separates the chest from the, the belly, is affected, then patients may develop um, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing a full breath in or out. Um, hands and feet muscle issues can cause um, weakness that can be localized to just certain areas and can cause disruption in day-to-day -day activity, such as combing your hair, washing your hair, drying your hair, eating, cutting your food, and all sorts of things. And so <clears throat> even though the mitochondrial myopathy affects primarily muscles, those muscles, because they are everywhere in the body, can cause multiple different manifestation in a patient. And just to illustrate how different those mitochondrial myopathy may look like, even though they are all affecting the muscle, because of that genetic makeup, there are many genes that can be affected and cause mitochondrial myopathy. And depending on that the, the type of gene that is affected, you can get very differently looking mitochondrial myopathy, myopathy. So this is a Brazilian patient, Arturito, who has a TK2 myopathy. This is one of those nuclear gene defects that is caused by a chromosomal DNA problem. And Arturito has such a severe weakness that he's unable to lift his head, he's unable to move his, his hands and feet, and he has to uh, be helped uh, breathing with this breathing machine, breathing machine, and so this is a pr pretty devastating uh, mitochondrial myopathy. As opposed to this older gentleman who has what we call chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, which is typically caused by a mitochondrial DNA disease, where a chunk of the mitochondrial DNA is missing that you see here. And um, this gentleman has the problem with the eyes almost exclusively. And as you can see in these pictures, he is unable to move his eyes in any direction. Even if you ask him to move them right, left, they barely move at all. And there's this ptosis or droopiness of the eyelid that you can observe here. So these two are both primary mitochondrial myopathy, but they look very differently because the gene that is um, the cause of the myopathy is different and can cause different degree of severity and different degree of presentation of the myopathy. 
Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry if you can't see this very well, but this is a table um, that lists one of some of the more common mitochondrial disease syndromes. You may recognize some of the names here, current Sears, myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red fiber, MELAS, NARP, or neuropathy, ataxia, retinitis pigmentosa, and Lee syndrome. And despite the fact that there is a lot of different um, symptoms that are listed here, um, mitochondria uh, muscle disease or muscle um, uh, being affected is really a predominant feature of all of these syndromes. So this is the difference between having a mitochondrial, pure mitochondrial myopathy where primarily the mus only the muscle is affected or a um, myopathy that is part of a genetic syndrome. So this is mitochondrial myopathy as part of the syndrome. What um, the earlier ones are primary mitochondrial myopathy, which are the pure kind of myopathy. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to stress upon you is the difference between a primary mitochondrial disease and a secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, and th this is important when we t in the context of neuromuscular diseases, because what we have, um, the, the, the field of mitochondrial medicine has evolved over the years. Um, when mitochondrial disorders were initially discovered, which wasn't long ago in the 80s, um, when, when the first gene was identified, um, the, the diagnosis has heavily relied on um, looking at the muscle and looking at the function of the mitochondria. And a lot of patients have received a diagnosis of mitochondrial disease or myopathy because their muscle looked, um, showed abnormalities in the mitochondria. But what we know today as of 2021 is that because mitochondria is involved in so many different things and, and, and is in every cell and can be affected by so many different things, um, any disease pretty much can cause mitochondria to look abnormal or to work um, differently. Um, but the difference between a primary mitochondrial disease and a secondary mitochondrial dysfunction, um, where we see mitochondrial problems um, when we look under a microscope or when we do tests in the lab is that the primary ones are caused by an inherited genetic defect, either in the mitochondrial DNA or the nuclear DNA, whereas a secondary mitochondrial dysfunction, there's nothing wrong with the genes. It's just that there is in the body some other process, some other disease process that is causing the mitochondria not to function properly. And those processes can be anything from environmental factors such as um, toxins and, and drugs, um, immu immunological disorders, cancers, metabolic disorders, which include diabetes and heart disease. And the normal aging process also causes mitochondria to work uh, less properly. And so we are trying to, as we try to better understand what the, what the underlying um, genetics and biology of mitochondrial disorders are, it's important for us to distinguish the genetic causes from the non-genetic causes to better serve the patients and really to try to get to the bottom of what the symptoms are, because a lot of these diseases here might have a specific treatment, whereas right now the genetic causes of mitochondrial problems don't have. So it, it would be um, unfortunate for someone to think that they have a mitochondrial disease where in fact they have a secondary mitochondrial dysfunction that might have a treatment that is available. Um, some of the um, other things that can ch cause the mitochondria to change um, to, to change um, it, it, its function are um, the athletic performance, um, adaptation to high altitude, uh, neurodegenerative disease, psychiatric disorders. Um, these can have, some of them can have a positive effect. So athletic performance um, can cause enhancement of how the mitochondria function. And so not everything is bad for the mitochondria, but there are mostly, um, exposures that will cause the mitochondria to malfunction. So there, there is a balance between things that can help your mitochondria function better and things that can cause your mitochondria to malfunction. So how do we, um, what do we do in 
when we suspect a mitochondrial disease. They are definitely difficult to recognize. One, because as I said, there are hundreds of different mitochondrial disorders um, because of the genetic heterogeneity and because of the biological function. Um, and each of these subtypes of mitochondrial disorder can look very differently clinically when they present. What is the first symptoms they present with? How severe the symptoms can be? What is the age they present with? Um, and sometimes Sometimes what makes it even more complicated is that different genes can cause the same symptoms and sometimes the, the same gene can cause different symptoms. And so that's why we, we try to um, have those patients who have a suspicion of a mitochondrial disease be seen by a mitochondrial expert to try to really sort out whether it's a primary issue or a secondary issue. The other thing that makes things difficult is that mitochondrial disease and myopathies have a very unpredictable course. They can be progressive, they can be unrelenting, and they can de um, change with stress. And so in, in this um, graph, what I try to illustrate is that um, a normal person um, is born with what we call a normal function. So they are at 100% of their function. And with the normal life progress, they keep that normal function over time. And as they start getting older, there's a decline in that function slowly. But if you are born with a mitochondrial disease, you start your life off with a functional level that is lower than the normal. And depending on whether you have severe disease, mild or moderate disease, your baseline level can be much lower here or a little bit uh, higher here. But as you go through life, any stressor that you come across, whether it's a, a sickness, a surgical procedure, um, uh, increased emotional stress, increased physical activity, it might cause your body to deteriorate even further. This is what we call the metabolic stress. And sometimes after you recover from the stress, your body never goes back to its baseline function. And so the decline is a lot more pronounced when you have a mitochondrial disease. And sometimes in clinic, when we see patients, we may not catch them here when they are in their um, most severe decline. So we may not be aware of the most severe symptoms that they are experiencing or the, the, the breadth of the different symptoms that they may have if we only see them when they are well and only complaining of fatigue or weakness. And that makes it very hard for the evaluating physician to get a grasp on the full picture of what's going on with the patient if they are only seeing the patient when they are well and not when they are at their worst. Okay, <clears throat> so how do we diagnose mitochondrial myopathies? There hasn't been really a good universal accepted diagnostic tool, although uh, most recently uh, with the advent of genetic testing, it has been a little bit easier to diagnose patients if we are able to find that gene or that mutation that explains the symptoms. So the way we proceed with the diagnosis is really to look at your symptoms. What are you complaining about? What um, organs are affected and what that um, uh, effect is on these organs? Looking at the family history because with primary mitochondrial disorder, chances are that you have inherited the mutation from one parent or two parents and you may have siblings that have similar issues, uh, parents that may have similar issues, and if it's a maternal inherited disease um, when the mother transmits the mitochondrial DNA mutation to all of her children her siblings and her mother and her grandmother uh, uncles and aunt may also have uh, similar symptoms so that's very helpful for us to to see uh, and then we go on to testing. Remember I showed you all the biochemical pathway that the mitochondria um, uh, is involved in. And so sometimes when we look at blood markers, urine markers, or cerebral spinal fluid markers, we are able to detect whether some of these pathways are disrupted. And that gives us a clue that the problem might lie into the mitochondria. 
We then do organ assessment to see whether we can find or see um, changes that were specifically linked to mitochondrial disease, uh, such as doing a brain MRI where certain um, abnormalities seen are really specific to mitochondrial disease. Sometimes um, we can find lactate peaks, um, which is the, uh, the marker that the body makes um, to create more energy. So lactate being elevated, it's, it's not exclusively seen in mitochondrial disease, but if you put it within the context of everything else, it gives you a, a good clue that mitochondrial disease should be on the top of, of your list of what's causing this. We look at the heart by doing an EKG tracing and looking at the structure of the heart by doing an echocardiogram gram we also look at the eye. Remember, mitochondrial myopathy, one of the major issues is the eye muscle. So we look to see whether there's the droopiness of the eyelid, whether there, the muscles around the eye are, um, are affected or not. We also look at the hearing because that's one of the things that can eventually get disrupted very early in life. <clears throat> and then when we have enough suspicion that um, mitochondrial disease or mitochondrial myopathy is at stake, we <clears throat> move on to more invasive um, things. So in the past, we used to do the muscle biopsy where we would open up typically in the thigh where the biggest muscle is located, the quadriceps. Uh, we open up a little incision here and we take a chunk of the muscle that we can then use under a microscope to look at the mitochondria itself and we know how an abnormal mitochondria looks like. Uh, we also stain the tissue with different stains and here you see the what we call the ragged red fibers. Um, all the red that you see here is proliferating mitochondria. This is this happens normally in any person that is aging. So anyone age 50 or more would have ragged red fiber. But the difference between an aging person and a mitochondrial disease person is that your, if you have mitochondrial disease, your ragged red fiber number is going to be higher than um, at a younger age than a normal aging person. And then we do staining for specific proteins of the mitochondria, like the Cox protein, the uh, SDH protein. And so this in the past used to be done routinely because again, if you find any of these abnormally looking mitochondria or positive stains for these abnormalities in the mitochondria, it gave you another hint that this was a mitochondrial disease. But now because we have genetic testing, this we do genetic testing first because it's less invasive. It's not a surgical procedure where we have to open up your muscle and take a chunk out of it. So we first do genetic testing. And what the genetic testing tells us is um, whether somebody in whom we suspect a mitochondrial disease carries a change in their nuclear DNA or mitochondrial DNA that has already been linked and known to cause mitochondrial disease. If that's the case, then case closed. You have a mitochondrial disease. If we don't find a specific answer or if we have an answer that we cannot really interpret, we may go back and do the muscle biopsy at a later date. But I can tell you myself and a lot of the other experts in mitochondrial disease, we're doing less and less muscle biopsies, if at all. Um, and <clears throat> an informal survey, an informal question to all the experts show that we've been doing like one or two biopsies every year now, as opposed to having done multiple um, each month before. And so genetic testing um, can be done on a single gene. So if you suspect, um, if you have a, a, that chronic or progressive external ophthalmoplegia, for example, where only the eye muscle are involved, most likely you have a deletion in your mitochondrial DNA. So we're not going to go look at all the mitochondrial genes, but we will focus on the nuclear, on the, that deletion. Um, and that's the only, um, the only, mitochondrial disease where a muscle tissue is important to, to get because that deletion is um, mostly found in muscle tissue. So you might, if you do your testing in the blood, you might not be able to see it. But for every other mitochondrial disease, a blood sample would be sufficient to do the genetic testing. So how does the genetic testing work? Um, <clears throat> you have um, 
you can look at one gene, you can look at different genes in what we call a panel. So the panel is anywhere from five to a thousand different genes. You can do exome sequencing. This is looking at all the genes, um, all the the, the portion of your DNA that we know carries genes that can affect your health, or we can do whole genome sequencing, um, which looks at all your DNA material, regardless of whether we know what it does or what it, what it doesn't. Um, whole genome sequencing remains at this stage more difficult to interpret, so it's not routinely done in clinical practice. But basically what we do is we look at the genes like we look at at sentences and books. We read all the letters of the code and we are trying to find a misspelling. So instead of red here, it's RDD, that's not normal. And like uh, when we read a book and we have a misspelling, we might not be able to understand the meaning of the word or that changes the meaning of the sentence. The same thing happens when, when you have a change in your DNA that is called a mutation. Um, the meaning of that, uh, of that, um, of that DNA changes. And so your body does not know what to do with that message. And instead of creating a protein out of it that is normal and functions properly, it either does not create a protein at all, or it creates a protein that looks very differently and is not doing its job. So that's what we do when we are looking at genetic testing. We're trying to find these misspellings. And sometimes we do find misspellings. Um, we all carry misspelling. You have, as you can imagine, we are born with copies of our DNA and every time our cells divide, they make copies of that DNA. So when you use a Xerox machine, the more copies you make, the blurrier, the darker those copies become. The same thing happens in nature. And by, by random chance, you can create misspellings in your DNA. So not every misspelling is going to cause human disease or cause you to have a mitochondrial disease, but some of those misspellings are so, um, are, happen in areas of the DNA that are so important that they would cause uh, disease. And so when you get your genetic, uh, genetic test report and it's, it, it shows all these different um, changes. It doesn't mean that you have diseases in all those genes that carry those changes. Um, it just means that they've observed them and most of these are what we call benign. They don't really cause human disease. Okay, so now that we have established that someone has a mitochondrial myopathy, what, how do we treat and manage them? Um, <clears throat> as I said, earlier, we don't have that magic pill yet to treat and cure mitochondrial diseases, but we can try to lessen the burden of the symptoms. And so always go back to what is mitochondrial disease. It's that energy problem. It's that oxidative stress uh, problem. It's that um, asking of your body to provide a lot more energy that, that your body can provide you. So minimizing energy losses is important. Avoiding stressors that can cause you to require more energy, um, using adequate rest with sleep and naps to recharge yourself, and optimizing energy gain, nutrition, exercise, and, and all of that. Um, there's also um, symptomatic treatment. So if you have certain organs that are affected, like the heart or the eyes or the, the ears, um, then we would send you to the specialist for that organ and they would treat you as if they, um, if you didn't have mitochondrial disease, they would treat the the, uh, the heart disease like they would do for anybody who has diabetes and heart disease or has high cholesterol and heart disease. They will treat you with certain medication that are not not specific to mitochondrial disease, but specific to the heart disease. There's also supportive care. So this is a disease that most likely affects several family members because it's genetic. And so there's a lot of emotional, social burden. Um, educational burden, um, and, and, and that it takes a toll on patients. And so we need to be mindful that supportive care also means supporting not just the patient, but the whole family. So uh, uh, early intervention for kids, social worker, case manager, support groups, and, and, and all of that. 
and then avoiding toxin like alcohol or smoking and things that we know can affect mitochondria so that we don't create more stress on the mitochondria than it already has from the genetic disease. One thing that I would like to bring your attention to is this paper that um, was um, initially published in 2019 online and in 2020 uh, in print. It's um, a, an international work, a working group of mitochondrial disease expert, pharmacists, toxicologists, who came together to create a new, um, a, a new list of safe drugs to use in primary mitochondrial disease, including uh, mitochondrial myopathy. So this, um, this um, list overrides all existing lists before. Um, this has, this was done after a very careful look and, and review of all the basic science um, uh, research study, um, the translational research study, clinical trial uh, uh, publications to try to really looking drug by drug, which ones have a firm uh, scientific evidence that there is mitochondrial toxicity or not. And so table one of the of the publication lists uh, the drugs that we studied. Um, so this is the group of the drug, the category, and within each group there were several drugs that were looked at, uh, including anesthetic, antiarrhythmic, and statins, which were listed prior on prior tables as toxic for mitochondrial disease patients. And the points that what we wanted to bring to your attention is that what the paper found is that most of these drugs are really safe to take um, in, in mitochondrial disease patient when prescribed by a doctor, prescribed with the right dosage and given with the right recommendation and the right surveillance. Um, there were only a few exceptions which are listed here on this table too. And I would like to bring your attention to this specific block here about neuromuscular and blocking drug used for anesthesia. In someone who has a myopathy, these um, sh should be used with caution um, or not used um, if, on, if there is an alternative to use. Um, just because they can affect the muscle, make it weaker, and the recovery period might be longer. Um, and so if you are undergoing a procedure, you can take this um, publication or refer to this publication to your anesthesiologist or to the person doing the procedure so that they can read it and avoid these blocking drugs. The important points that I would like to make is that the the paper talks about mitochondrial toxicity specifically. Um, there is a difference between a drug side effect, which can occur with any medicine, any drug that you take, even over the counter. Um, and those can happen in any person, regardless of whether they have mitochondrial disease or not, from mitochondrial toxicity, meaning that taking the drug will specifically affect you differently because of your underlying mitochondrial disease. And so I think um, that needs to be understood because um, a lot of the reports out there are reporting on side effects of medication as opposed to um, reactions that happen because the patient had a mitochondrial disease, which is very different. Okay, um, <clears throat> so what should you do with the list? Um, really, um, you, these are clickable links. Um, you can you can go to MitoAction, UMDF, uh, and um, IMP, International uh, Mitochondrial Patient Support Group, um, and they they have the list of these uh, tables and they have the publication as well that you can freely download. <clears throat> okay, what other um, management? do we recommend for myopathy patient? Well, despite the counterintuitive aspect of it, that the patient are complaining about weakness and fatigue, doing exercise is really helpful. Um, and sometimes this is difficult to, um, to accept by the patient because you're you, you, we're asking you to really, um, to, to really 
use your muscle for more physical activity that may make you more tired and, more, and, and weaker. But over the long term, this is really very important because um, scientifically, studies have shown that exercise done uh, on a regular basis, so at least three times a day, uh, three times a week, um, which includes both cardiovascular exercise, the kind that increases your heart rate, and strength training, the kind that works certain muscle group repetitively, um, really enhances the, the body's capabilities of making more healthy mitochondria and getting rid of the unhealthy mitochondria. And so it's kind of like gene therapy by doing exercise. And I'm going to show you this video just to illustrate that point. So this is a cage with four different mice. These are all littermate, meaning that they are all brothers. They were born at the same time. They were housed in the same cage. They ate the same food, drank the same water. The only difference between these two that look much like a very normal mouth, they are pretty normal in size. They are, are moving constantly. And these two that look very gray, lost their hair, and are not moving, shivering in the corner, is that these two black mouse mice have been exercised for about 45 minutes three times a week um, since the time they were able to exercise as opposed to these two that haven't been exercised at all all of these mice carry a genetically inherited mitochondrial disease and so you could see just by changing their exercise activity you we, they were able to keep these mice from developing the disease and so I hope that this convinced you that exercise is very important. And the question I get asked a lot is how much exercise do I have to do? It doesn't have to be at the gym for an hour, you're sweating to death and you're lying on your sofa the next day, not able to move because you're so sore. It can be five minutes, it can be 10 minutes, whatever you can do to really get your body going. Um, and listening to your body cues so that you stop when you're in pain or when you're lightheaded or when you're short of breath and you're fatigued. You can start by five minutes or two minutes. I have patients who can do one minute three times a day and that's all I can do. But six months from now, you might be able to do 15 minutes and then six months later, maybe 30 minutes. So just do as much as you can do and follow your body cues. And then over time, your stamina is going to improve and you will be able to do more. Next are the, um, the, 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 treat, the use of the supplements. Um, in the past, we've prescribed a lot of different supplements um, that, that are listed here. Um, the Mitochondrial Medicine Society does not recommend prescribing all of these supplements to patients with mitochondrial disease. And this is the publication from 2015 where we lay out all those recommendations. So the three supplements that have some clinical trial evidence that they might be efficacious include the CoQ10 in the form of ubiquinol, alpha lipoic acid and riboflavin, which is vitamin B2, and folinic acid for those patients who have the mitochondrial deletion and may have folinic acid deficiency in their brain, and carnitine for those who have a documented carnitine deficiency. And so as you see, only CoQ10, alpha lipoic acid, and riboflavin have been recommended. Um, and then the other two in, in, in case of a deficiency. Um, what we ask of our patient is to start these therapies one by one because we don't know if they will work or not. The, there is no test that we can do to double check that they are working or not. <clears throat> so we rely on the patient to tell us if they feel less fatigue, if they feel less weakness. And um, starting them all together at once, you won't know which one is working and which one is not. Um, I put this here just to showcase how much more interest has been given to mitochondrial disease in the last year. So this, these are the years from 1980 to 2010, and this brown line is mitochondrial disease scientific publication. And as you can see, there's been um, a peak in, in these publication, and, and now mitochondrial publications surpass any pub scientific publication about any other organelle in the cell. So there's a lot more interest in, in doing um, mitochondrial research and mitochondrial disease trial. And there is a lot of drug development um, in, in 
in process that includes looking at all sorts of different compounds that I, I listed here. In the interest of time, I'm just going to speed up a little bit and show you how many clinical trials um, have been ongoing for mitochondrial disease and mitochondrial myopathy specifically. These are all clinical trials that have been ongoing since 2010 in this space. I'm going to focus just a little bit on the primary mitochondrial myopathy specifically. These um, elemepertide trials uh, looked specifically at um, finding in primary mitochondrial myopathy adult patient. Um, this is the, the trial that went, went the furthest to the phase three that is needed just prior to FDA approval. Unfortunately, it did not show that it benefited the mitochondrial myopathy patient. So that um, program has uh, been on hold for now. Um, the motor study using Omeva Loxalone also looked specifically at um, the efficacy uh, in primary mitochondrial myopathy. And again, it did not show that it has improved the myopathy in these patients and was terminated. Um, but niacin supplementation, niacin is a drug that is used in cardiology to decrease the, um, the amount of, uh, of uh, lipid in the blood, has been used in mitochondrial myopathy patient in a small trial and has shown that patient have impro had improved weakness and, 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 um, and had improved um, NAD, which is the, bi the biological um, um, factor that uh, causes your mitochondria to function properly. Um, so patients in this trial had higher NAD, NAD um, levels in, in, their, in their blood. So this is a promising, um, promising uh, compound and we need a, a larger trial to make sure that this effect is seen in a larger population of primary mitochondrial myopathy. Um, Bezofibrates is also a, a drug that has tri was tried in mitochondrial myopathy patient. It didn't really show um, uh, improvement. Uh, res resveratrol also um, was tried um, that is pending publication. Um, and then in the future, we will be having different um, trials that I will go over in a second. Um, I put this in here to show you that also the TK2, the alter ego baby um, that I showed you earlier with the complete paralysis, um, these patients were enrolled in the TK2 trial and that has shown a, a lot of improvement in these uh, children who went from being bedridden to being able to sit up, being able to move some of their limbs. So this is a very encouraging clinical trial that is in process and has included now more than 30 patients world, worldwide. Um, there are many more trials, including trials with um, gene therapy in other mitochondrial disease um, uh, groups. Um, but if those were to work, then translating them into myopathy patient is going to be um, more easily achieved. Um, for your information, um, clinicaltrial.gov is, um, is a public uh, website where all the clinical trials are listed worldwide. You can go in and put mitochondrial myopathy here under condition or disease, and you can click search, and it will bring you to a page where all the clinical trials of, for mitochondrial myopathy would be listed. I wanted to bring your attention to two studies that will be starting soon. Um, the study of the efficacy and safety of 24-week treatment with this compound, REN001, for mitochondrial myopathy, as well as um, this one for ASP0367. We, um, these, tri these two trials will be starting in the next few months in the U.S., and so you should keep your eyes open on when they start. The way um, you can contact these clinical trial sites is if you scroll down, so when you go into the clinicaltrial.gov and you have this, this window here, you just scroll down and it takes you to more information and it tells you who the sites are in the US and where, who the contact is. There's nothing now here because these trials are not active yet, but once they become active, you will see the list of all the sites in the US with their contact information and you can directly contact them. Um, at Mass General, where I work, we're also looking for primary mitochondrial myopathy patient to do qualitative interviews. So if you're interested, um, you can call us or email us, uh, and we will happy to give you more information. 
Um, so what's next? We like to better understand the disease, develop better diagnostic and monitoring tools, develop disease modifying and symptomatic therapies for our patient with mitochondrial myopathy and mitochondrial disease in general. And in the US, we've started to do that by um, trying to harmonize how the mitochondrial disease community works together. So right now in the US, we have you, the patient, our patient, and your families at the heart of all of this. This is why we do this day in and day out. We have clinicians that see patients in, in, in the clinics. We have patient advocacy group like the MTA, professional society like the Mitochondrial Medicine Society, research consortia, um, and, and, and our industry partners. So you are at the heart of all of this. And then um, aside from the MDA, in our disease community, we have the UMDF, the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, Mitochondrial Disease Action Co Com Committee, Hugs for Mito, and uh, if you live in Colorado, there are there's miracles for Mito as well. Um, all of these websites uh, have a lot of information available on their website that you can um, look up for the. Um, Advancing education of other clinicians, people who are not expert in mitochondrial disease. The Mitochondrial Medicine Society has developed um, publication, consensus statement, guidelines for how we diagnose, how do we manage, how do we treat mitochondrial disease patients. All of these are freely available on our websites. Um, all of the links to all of these publications, including the ones that I showed you today, are on our website. So you can just go to mitosoc, M-I-T-O-S-O-C dot org, and you can freely download them, or you can give um, the, the site, the address to your clinical care providers, and they can look at them themselves. Sorry. We have um, our research consortia, the North American Mitochondrial Disease Consor Consortium under the, um, the leadership of Dr. Michio Hirano out of Columbia University. This is our uh, North American National Registry for Mitochondrial Diseases. We have about 1,800 patients right now. You can contact NAMDAC yourself and see if you are close to a site that can enroll you or you can enroll yourself in the RDCRN registry. More information are on the website. Um, the MCN, or the Mitochondrial Care Network, has been launched in 2018. It's a, uh, a gathering of 23 sites across the U.S. that have been given the label of mitochondrial medicine expert sites. And so these are staffed by directors that are expert in mitochondrial disease. And if you haven't seen one yet, um, you should contact one of these sites and have yourself um, checked to make sure that you have your molecular diagnosis and that you're getting the optimized therapy that you need. This is our website, again, uh, mitonetwork.org, where you can find all the, um, the, the list of all the sites. Uh, we work a lot with researchers across the U.S. and uh, outside of the U.S. We work with pharmaceutical companies trying to build these clinical trials to enroll our patients. And we also work with the FDA, the NIA, to the government to try to improve uh, awareness of the, of the disease and accelerate the pathway to drug approval for mitochondrial disease patients. And so in conclusion, mitochondrial dis disorders are heterogeneous, are very complicated, complex, and they can affect um, mildly, moderately, or severely any patient of any age. Together, they are not so rare. One in 4,300 is not really rare. And there is still a tremendous unmet need in, in trying to manage and treat our patient that we are hoping to fill uh, with all the harmonization that we are doing uh, currently. So there's a lot of hope on the way. There are trials, foundation, consortia research. Um, so you should be as involved in, in, in any or all of these um, so that you can stay aware and uh, abreast of all the new changes coming. And with that, I will stop and I will take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Kerr. We do have a couple questions. And with regards to speech, can mitomyopathy cause the voice to become hoarse or lose your voice due to just normal amount of talking throughout the day? Yes, it can. Again, um, it's, there's a muscle there that helps with, uh, with, uh, with the voice and like every muscle gets weak, that muscle can also get weak as well. Okay. 
And for patients with suspected mitochondrial disease that have a negative WES, W-E-S, what are the criteria for using muscle biopsies or other diagnostic tools to come to a more definitive diagnosis? Yeah, so that's a complex question. As I explained, you, we have to look at the symptoms at the family history and everything else. Um, and so I can't really give a, a specific answer not knowing the case and the case details, uh, but that's one of the reasons why someone would go to um, one of these MCN sites to gotcha. have a second opinion. Okay. Um, this person was diagnosed with a muscle biopsy uh, because insurance would not pay for genetics. They're asking how important is genetic testing if you already have a biopsy done? Yeah, so again, because of all the, the advancement and the clinical trials that are available now, um, the treatment and the ability to participate in this clinical trial right now is contingent of having that molecular diagnosis and that confirmation. Um, it, there are certain syndromes of mitochondrial disease that are so obvious that a muscle bi biopsy might be sufficient, but right now, um, in order to be better categorized and have availability to participate in clinical trial, that molecular diagnosis is necessary. Okay. I might mispronounce this. <laughs> Could a how do you, heterozygous TFAM mutation reducing mtDNA copy number contribute to symptoms such as ptosis, hearing loss, and neutropenia? Neutropenia. Uh, so a heterozygous one should not because that should be a recessive disease, meaning that you need two copies of the gene to be affected for the disease to express itself. So one okay. copy only being affected should not. Okay. Um, if you have a mitochondrial myopathy diagnosis, but most of the worst symptoms are nerve and brain related, does that make it an encephalomyopathy? Our, diagno yeah. our diagnosis is a 14 year old, so I yeah. know the science has changed. It, it would make it an encephalomyopathy. Those are some big words. <laughs> Well, that's good. The, the patients are very savvy in our days, and that's great because they are taking ownership of their care and their health. Exactly. Exactly. Um, what's, um, I'm looking for information in trials for infantile onset spinal cerebral ataxia. Is so again, that clinicaltrial.gov okay. website is your go-to place. Um, okay. you should, if you can, sometimes if you put like the whole definition, you might not find uh, clinical trials available. So try to, if you don't find anything, try to break it down, just put ataxia and then scroll through or just infantile ataxia. Um, okay. But play with it until you find what you're looking for. Okay, we have another person that's typed in, they have a primary mitochondrial myopathy and have found that living at an altitude in dry climates makes a significant difference. Is there any research that supports that experience that they're? Um, I would, I would be interested to know how different, is it different mm -hmm. in the positive or the negative, but you're right. There are, um, the Dr. Vamzi Mutha out of Mass General has been publishing since 2016, the effect of low oxygen on mm -hmm. mitochondrial um, disease. His work has focused on mice, um, but um, there, there is a, a robust evidence that low oxygen might improve mitochondrial uh, function. And so, um, depending on what, what, in what direction your symptoms are going, um, yes, there, there is a biological reason of my, why you might feel different at high, at high altitude. They're saying it's a positive difference, so. Yeah. Perfect. Um, what is the website again to find the um, Mito Clinics? So it's uh, the Mitochondrial Care Network. Um, if you want to um, just I'll type that Google, in, mitochondrial. Google that. And if not, it's the mitonetwork.org. Mito no, I put that in the chat. Mm -hmm. All right, there you go. Um, and then we had a question come through the chat. Let me see. Can you please repeat how to get a list of safe and unsafe drugs for mitochondrial myopathy? Yeah, so that uh, paper is available uh, on any of the Mito Advocacy Group's website, and it's also available on the Mitochondrial Medicine Society, which would be the easiest because it's not as busy the website as the advocacy groups. So it's mitosoc.org, 
mito.soc. And if you hit the button education, a list of all the publication will, would um, become available and you can just click on that um, paper. Okay, okay. Um, how quickly does exercise lead to increased quality and quantity of mitochondria? And they're, in, they're asking about the recent job research um, su suggesting the importance of nicotin nicotinic acid and glucose. Yeah, so um, it's not right away. You need okay. months uh, of physical activity before you, um, you, you can experience the benefit. That's why you shouldn't start very um, intense so not to lose interest and the important thing is continuity and doing it on a, on a regular basis um, for at least six months. Um, the, the new publication out of CHA, um, I haven't read it in detail, but it was done on, on a, a cell model, not in humans. And okay. uh, the nicotinamide is a cousin of the niacin, which I talked about in the clinical trial. So that's, those are vitamin D, uh, vitamin B3 derivatives um, supplements that have been shown in multiple aspects to be helpful, but they come in different shapes and, and doses. And so we don't know right now which one of them is better uh, suited. Okay. And not all of them work the same on each symptom of mitochondrial disease, which is why we're not telling everyone to take them right now. Sure, sure. Um, this person says their son genetic, the, my son's genetics test came back that his MTCYB gene is affected. Does this mean he does in fact have mitochondrial disease? So I can't tell you just by the, that information. Um, I have to see what the, the report says exactly. Okay. As I said, there are changes that can be disease causing and changes that happen to be there just by random chance. So without knowing the details, of the symptoms and the genetic testing, it's hard to tell. Okay. Sorry, we're getting a lot of questions and I know I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of our time here. Um, this person's asking, is it better to ventilate BiPAP sooner rather than later when you have respiratory muscle involvement? Um, so there are criteria of when someone needs to be. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not just if you feel whenever you feel like it, the, you, there are tests like uh, respiratory testing and functional uh, capacity that need to be assessed and oxygen saturation that would dictate when someone um, would have to be ventilated or use non-invasive ventilatory support. Okay. Um, so I would suggest you talk to your doctor about that. Okay. Um, just take a couple more and then we're gonna move on. This person says, they've seen a lot of speculation about mitochondrial dysfunction potentially playing a role in long COVID. Are mitodocs expecting that we may learn things about managing mito through research on COVID? We may. I mean, as I okay. said, mitochondria is at the heart of every <laughs> disease. Virtually everything goes back to yeah. mitochondria. And so knowing more about any of these diseases might potentially help patients with a primary mitochondrial disease. That's why that list of publication has been skyrocketing because everyone is realizing now that mitochondria is somehow involved in everything. And so that's great for us because the more people do research on mitochondria, regardless of what's causing the mitochondria not to function properly, the better it is for us. Okay. And I know we've got some questions that have come in regarding exercise and genetics, and we actually have a uh, physical therapist coming in to talk later about exercise, and we have a geneticist coming up um, later in the day as well. So we will go ahead and um, answer that. I will just end with this one last question, and um, thank you, Dr. Kara. This, this person saying their son had a muscle biopsy that shows some signs of mitochondrial disorder, but his neuro at the time said the amount was so small that they couldn't determine if he has mitochondrial disorder. Is he still, or I'm sorry, he is still underneath mitochondrial as an unspecified disorder. His current doctor has him under mitochondrial myopathy. Is there a test that he can take to confirm mitochondrial myopathy? Genetics. Genetic. Genetic yep. tests, yeah. Okay. More, and we will. Most likely a, an exome sequencing. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate no your time today. Thank you everyone for having me. Have a good day.